So again, a very warm, warm welcome um, to today's um, Espen Germany event um, on a topic which is on everybody's minds, I would say. Um, striking back how impactful are Western sanctions uh, against Russia. Um, I am really, really delighted that we have an excellent panel of experts today with us um, who are going to make sense of the current sanctions, um, what they can do, uh, what we can expect from them, um, how they are going to affect Russia, but also how they are going to affect us. Um, a little earlier in our pre-discussion, we talked about the role of think tanks or platforms as, uh, as Aspen. And we said that the main reason for uh, an important, uh, an important uh, job we have to do is to explain. To explain and analyze and make sense of the situation which we are currently facing. And that is what we are trying to do um, today um, taking a closer look at the um, situation in also in the Ukraine um, and if the, um, the, the answer of the West implementing sanctions is going to change um, the, the behavior. As you all know, um, as we always do in good Aspen fashion, I have to um, start with a few housekeeping rules. This is organized as a meeting. So I want you to um, really participate, um, ask questions. You do so, can do so by raising your hand, your electronic hand, or to write um, by writing in the chat function. Um, and I also would like to ask you to turn on your cameras. It's so much nicer to see all of you um, instead of talking to a black, a black little box. Um, so please, and even if you don't do it from the start on, as soon as we start the discussion, please uh, turn on um, your camera. So let me first um, welcome and um, introduce to you Professor Gabriel Felbermeier. You're one of, well, I mean, before you moved to Austria again, you were one of the leading economists in Germany. Um, you were with the um, uh, Kieler Institute for Weltwirtschaft, and um, now you have, have gone to the competition, so to say, <laughs> the Austrian Institute of Economic uh, Research. You have done a lot of work on trade issues, um, so you know uh, what the sanctions are going to mean um, also for global value chains um, and um, uh, how big the disruptions are going to be, and you're going to kick us off um, in, the in, in the presentations um, in, in a second. I'm also really delighted um, to introduce a good friend. Um, I almost said a good old friend, but she's not so old, um, Julia Friedlander. Um, Julia um, has worked on, oh, sanctions, export controls, investment screening, and many other um, issues, um, both from a practical point of view um, in the US government, as well as from, a, um, from the point of view of, a, a, uh, researcher um, and, and uh, academics really. And you can, I think you can give us both sides um, and maybe give us also a little bit of an insight um, of what is currently happening um, in, uh, in the United States um, in the um, Biden, Bi Biden administration. I'm also really happy to welcome Michael Harms. Um, Michael um, is the executive director of the German Committee on Eastern European Economic Relations, um, in German Kurz Ostausschuss der Deutschen Wirtschaft. <laughs> and um, there is nobody else who is as close um, to German business, um, especially those businesses who have a lot of Russia or had a lot of Russia business. Um, and um, you can really give, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can give us an excellent overview um, of what is um, the, the, um, the, the feeling um, and also the, well, the vulnerability um, of German business vis-a-vis um, -vis the sanctions. And we are also very interested in hearing um, if German business again says, this is the um, primat der Politik, the primacy um, of 
politics um, as it was last time uh, when Russia um, invaded the Krim. Jana Hecker, um, Jana, it's uh, wonderful that you are being here today. Jana is also a member of the uh, Kuratorium of the Aspen Germany Institute. Um, and you are a experienced capital markets expert um, with a really long standing track re record um, in the financial services industry. And um, you will make sense for us what the sanctions are going to mean for the financial sector. And I hope you will also explain to us a little bit how those central bank sanctions are working, how those bank sanctions are working and what impact um, they are having. And also what we are seeing with regard to commodity prices um, and other, other asset prices. And I heard that you are currently um, in the United States and the first question you, you were asked was, um, what about the gas prices in London? Um, so that is a topic which is of great, great interest. Last but not least, um, let me also welcome um, Alexander Schönfelder. Um, thank you so much for being with us, um, despite everything what the uh, government has to take uh, care of currently. And I'm sure that was also the reason for the call. Um, so whenever you have to drop off for a second, um, please, please do so. We certainly understand. Um, Thank you so much, um, Alexander, for joining us today. Um, you have been with the uh, Foreign Office uh, for quite a while, but since 2018, um, no, I, I'm sorry, since, um, since now, is it correct? Since 2018, you have been specifically responsible um, for um, economic and trade issues um, and also worked, I know that you worked a lot on China issues, um, that you worked a lot on sovereignty, European sovereignty issues. Um, and um, we know each other from, from before, so to say, before I uh, moved to Aspen when I was still with BDI, we had a lot of discussions about yeah, about the importance of uh, diversification and independence and having good instruments to counter coercive policies from abroad. And um, I'm looking forward also to hearing um, from you. So let us, uh, let me kick, kick off our discussion um, with one um, question um, to all of you. And I would like to ask you um, to answer very briefly. Um, and my question is on a scale from zero to five. Um, what would you say, how impactful are the sanctions, with five being the most impactful and zero being the least impactful? And I would like to start with Gabriel. Uh, Stormy, that's a difficult one, but uh, let's shoot for 3.5. 3.5, and I will ask in, in the second round of questions why you choose 3.5. Um, <laughs> Alexander. Yeah, I, I would say six uh, because we were fast, we were quite united, and we did it in an unprecedented way. And it seems that Moscow is, uh, it's totally unexpected what's happening uh, for, for Putin. Uh, the stock exchange is closed, um, the Russian bonds is, are reduced to junk bonds, uh, the ruble is worthless basically, um, the inflation is high, going into hyperinflation is a real stress test for almost all of the Russian banks, although most of them are not really uh, de-swifted right now. Um, and um, th there's a high percentage of the Russian uh, foreign currency reserves that are frozen. Um, and I think that all this leads me to say that um, we are at, at, uh, at six, um, but we could even go further. Uh, this is not uh, the end, uh, so to speak. Um, we see that exporters are basically uh, were acting as um, uh, Russian exporters act as, as the central bank um, of, of Russia because they have to, to deliver all the foreign currency reserves. And, and further repercussions are, are obvious. And for us, and maybe that's something that we could discuss later, um, there's also a, a, a very interesting development uh, that many, many German companies and European companies and US companies, by the way, also are getting out of the Russian market, although they don't, they don't have to. I think that's a very interesting discussion and very interesting development. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jana, your take um, on the impactness of the sanctions. Yeah, effectiveness 
in what? Yes, I mean, I agree with Alexandra. They're really effective in hurting the economy and turning Russians, Russia and affiliated in, into international parias in, in the financial markets and in, in the general economy. But are they effective to remove Putin and stop this war? I've got concerns. Oh, I would rate it lower, let's say. So maybe five or four and a half on effectiveness, hurting the economy and turning the Russians into the, into the evil man, into removing Putin, probably less than three in my mind. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for this um, more differentiated picture. I guess we should have differentiated a little bit more when asked with the question. Ah, um, Michael. I also would like to differentiate a, a little bit. If you mean the impact on Russian economy, I would say a four. I'm not so can take it uh, uh, optimistic or pessimistic like Alexander Schoenfelder, because I still think that the uh, sanctions in the financial sphere and in all what is connected to technology are really disastrous for Russia. But in uh, services or basic industries, I think it can be substituted. And here, the role of China is crucial. So if China is ready and willing to substitute some industrial issues in Russia or even give technology to Russia. So maybe the effects will not be so disastrous. I think uh, we can discuss that. If we look at the impacts on the German business or German industry, I would say it's uh, two maybe, because uh, we are not so dependent on Russia if we look at the size of the market. Across the board, the uh, turnover of the Russian business is something like between two, two and four percent for the branches, so it is uh, it is not so important. But if it comes to energy sanctions, here the German industry or European industry is really vulnerable. If it comes, for example, to sanctions from Russia, so therefore it can uh, change to the worse. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, uh, Julia. Thank you. I think if we say that the strategy is, which I believe it is right now, to destroy the Russian economy, then I would even go for a seven or sending them back to 1991. Um, if we're talking about the intention to end a war, I think we're probably at a two. Oh, okay. Um, even a little bit um, lower than what Jana said with regard to impact on Russia um, and changing the behavior. Thank you so much uh, for this kickoff. Um, Gabriel, could you tell us a little bit more about um, the sanctions, what's part of the sanctions, so that we are all on the same, um, on the same page, what we are actually talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are, let's say, three big um, dimensions of the sanction regime that has been put into place. Uh, first of all, there are export restrictions on certain goods that are deemed uh, high-tech or essential for the war effort, dual-use technologies, for example. Then there are travel restrictions, asset freezes, and other measures that affect individuals and certain firms, so the lists that, that, that have been put together. And then it was already part of our discussion uh, the most impactful part of it, probably the financial sanctions. Do you? Um, Gabriel, your yes. picture is frozen, but we can hear you just fine. Okay. So, so the financial sanctions are those that, that uh, are probably most impactful. Mm -hmm. oh, and now we lost him completely. Um, we, we were afraid that that might happen, but I think he's going to join us um, in a second ag uh, again. He's facing a little bit of um, technical difficulties. Um, so here I am again. Is this very King Stormy? Yeah. Uh, oh, there you are again. Very good. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I had quite a journey today. Maybe that's interesting. I, 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 I took a train from Vienna to Munich, a train that was, I have never seen a fuller train. It is full of Ukrainian refugees. I took the train to Munich and you know it took me an hour or two longer than was, was planned. So I'm now at Tutzing at the Stamberger See, beautiful setting, sunshine, dark blue water, peace. You know, the contrast is quite is quite something. But so so this the financial sanctions are what, what is the most uh, impactful, I would say. 
Uh, and uh, the, the surprise, uh, Alexander has already mentioned it, for many, also for me, was the move uh, to, to freeze assets of the Russian Central Bank that are deposited or held uh, in uh, Frankfurt, in Zurich, in Washington, in London. And uh, that was certainly a surprise for the Russian government, because otherwise they would have prepared to that. No? And uh, uh, that means that the, the, the central bank has no direct access to its uh, reserves anymore, at least those reserves held uh, in, uh, in the foreign countries, and um, cannot um, sell those reser reserves to, um, to keep the, ru the, the ruble up. No? And uh, that's, um, that's something that, that, uh, that we see in the data already. Although uh, it's also true that um, uh, the Russians have reacted uh, and they are forcing their exporters, exporters of petroleum, of metals, of gas, to uh, recycle 80% of their export revenues uh, and buy rubles. Uh, and, and that props up the, um, uh, the exchange rate, of course. Uh, we, we are, these sanctions uh, essentially mean that the Western banks are not allowed to do any business anymore in the sense of credit uh, loans uh, transactions the payment payment system is still open for most banks there some banks are have been uh, have been listed uh, but uh, it's not true that the entire payments system would have been blocked no? so uh, if you could, if, if we have a big database the global sanctions database that we've put together I think from 2016 onwards with colleagues from Philadelphia, from Drexel School, from that Drexel University. And if we compare, you know, the, the, the sanction regimes that we have there, we're, we're talking about a, a very comprehensive and a very broad regime. You know, because we know that financial sanctions can be very impactful. We've tried to simulate that in a model and deconnecting Russia from the global financial system is almost as effective as having a complete embargo in goods and services trade. Right? Because it, because it really becomes difficult to, 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 to do business. Um, and the, uh, the, the nice element of financial sanctions is if, if, if the uh, US uh, and the UK and Europe and Japan and Switzerland are in a coalition together, this is almost like a multilateral sanctions regime. Of course, there's still China, and, and, but, but it, it is almost multilateral. And that's why it is... At the, at the one hand, very painful for the uh, Russian economy, and on the other hand, not so terribly expensive for us because the burden is shared with the Brazilians, with the Indians, right? Also, probably with some Chinese who are working through the Western financial system when they transact with uh, with Russia. So, we with the financial sanctions, we extra we multilateralize uh, or extra territorialize. I don't know how the right word is these sanctions, and that that is this. That's why we would call them smart sanctions. Important thing also to mention is that, of course, since 2014, we already have sanctions. And uh, the trade with Russia has already gone down quite a bit. We, you know, those sanctions probably have, have reduced German trade with Russia by something like 40% compared to the counterfactual we would normally uh, expect trade to be. And that, of course, means that uh, the leverage we have today in 2022 is 40% smaller than the leverage we uh, we had before. German banks have left Russia to, 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 to quite some extent. The Austrians have stayed, uh, Societe Generale has stayed, uh, Credito has stayed, but, but there has already been quite an effect. And so um, if we add the sanctions regime that we already had before and the one we're having now, well, then we're getting towards something relatively, relatively tough. When it says 3.5 or 5, then what I mean is that we still have, if 5 is the max, no? We still have scope, and, and I think Alexander has 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 said too. No, we still uh, could go after after uh, petrol, of course, after gas, after metals. No, um, that is something that needs needs to be discussed. Um, last comment from the literature of, of, but you guys know maybe better than me. Um, we know that once we apply sanctions, we we actually declare failure. No, because the the sanction is put in place essentially means that the threat of imposing sanctions, if some red line is crossed, has not worked. And I think here, the question of credibility is essential. And in my reading of what happened is that from 2014 to 2022, we have not built up credibility, you know, and we have not worked on that hard enough and did things like 
you know, that maybe corrupted that credibility, that, um, that, uh, that I have produced the situation that we, that we see now. Because if, uh, I, I don't know, no one really can look into, into the brains of Vladimir Putin, but um, the sanctions we've put in place are painful. And um, uh, it's not clear to me, you know, whether, whether that was credible enough, it, it, um, uh, you know, before we put the sanctions in place. And that lack of credibility may have led Putin to do something that put, 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 possibly he regrets now. If he had known that we were able to do those sanctions, go after the, the, the central bank reserves and preserve that unity uh, across the Atlantic uh, and within the EU, which is actually quite uh, quite stunning and um, something we need to congratulate, I think, our uh, colleagues at the, at the foreign office, because it's probably not an easy easy job to keep Hungary, Hungary and you know, all the other elements in Europe uh, uh, in the coalition. And this is a, a perfect lead over to Alex, um, Alexander. Um, could you tell us a little bit um, about the rationale behind the sanctions, how you decided which, which type of sanctions were to be applied and, um, and also the surprise of the unity and fastness. Um, how was that achieved in such a short amount of time? Well, it's, it's basically something that, that we have prepared for months and also specifically with our uh, US partners and uh, with France and uh, some allies in the G7 formats. I think that's something that uh, uh, was prepared. And we have learned from what we did uh, uh, in, in 2014, uh, what we did uh, during the Iranian sanction regimes, um, what uh, other sanction regimes told us um, when they were uh, inaugurated, I think. Uh, unity came about also because of, um, of a very strong transatlantic uh, European US uh, exchange on these subjects. I think that, that, was, that was key. Um, and I think the, um, the current US government, of course, is, um, is, a, is a much better partner, uh, to be very honest in, in this respect. Uh, than the previous one. Um, but again, um, there are still uh, differences on, on, on certain aspects, but uh, they are much less obvious and much less dominant. Um, and I think that was, that was a prerequisite. Uh, and I think um, um, that um, coming together uh, in Europe, Gabriel was uh, probably much easier than you think. Um, I think we have not heard from, from Hungary or any other a European partner, which was um, maybe a little bit more difficult in the past. Uh, when it came to this discussion, we were united from the very beginning. And um, I think this also has, of course, um, something to do with the fact that they are much closer to Russia than we are, geographically speaking. So I think that, um, that that's the main reason. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, turning over or handing over to Julia, um, we heard already something about transatlantic unity, um, which uh, was larger this time than probably any time over the last five years. Um, what is the current, what is the sentiment currently um, in the Biden administration? And I think it's um, a shared assessment of shock even though we had you know the u.s government had presaged this and thought that this was the most likely outcome um and um on you know un unflagging unflagging will to um to to keep going um and to not sort of um throw in you know um, say throw in the towel to, to say that this is an un this is an unwinnable thing I think that there are a couple of different sort of categories that which with which the you know at least from the US calculus that we saw that the sanctions were going to do first it was going to the sheer messaging of it was going to deter ostensibly right and that is what allowed for the preparations for the trend because we knew you know that we were going to take a different strategy than in 2014 where it took months to get the executive orders in place. It took, you know, getting the packages and then talking about and then getting, you know, building that transatlantic unity. This was sort of taking that and put, putting it on steroids. It was like we had woken a beast. And so from that, you know, from seeing how, the, the, at least from the US perspective, and again, as someone who was at the Treasury Department, the rhythm of preparation was entirely different. 
Um, and I think that that's important to underscore here because it's not only a political sanctions are not only a political statement, they are functional financial regulatory tools um, and take a lot of uh, hard work to put them into place. And so doing that preparatory work allowed for that, you know, massive, uh, massive ramp up. Um, and so, you know, no, we did not deter it from starting. What do you do now? Do you try to uh, bankrupt bankrupt a country in time to prevent a war to keep them from to say oh this you know now we're going to negotiate okay maybe you can maybe that's possible and the next step after that is to say we're going to bankrupt them so that they can't do worse or more right uh, elsewhere in the region um and so war is war costs money fighting an insurgency costs money the u.s knows that from iraq a lot of money um and then the last one is essentially um, punishment is deterrence, right? We have um, as a signal to the world, democracy versus autocracy. And that I think is what resonates the most in the Biden administration right now fits into that narrative. We're standing up for what's right, right? Even if, even if we lose, right? Even if we, even if we um, bankrupt uh, Russia while they can still flatten Ukraine, we will have won that. So that those are sort of, I think, the, the progression of the narrative over here. And can you also tell us a little bit about the oil embargo? The oil embargo means pretty much nothing. Um, I, you know, if I, from an from an economic perspective, I would say, why add that inflationary pressure to the to an, our our entire market and skittish oil traders who are are you know. So you know, the U.S. already imports very little oil from Russia to begin with. We did that after we started pressuring Venezuela. When Venezuela came off, the grade of crude that we needed had to be replaced from somewhere, and the Russians could provide it. Um, and so it really is a, a really small chunk of what of what the U.S. imports, and, and then really we don't really import that much coal and no gas. So I think that there's um, it is a symbolic measure. Um, what I would say also, and I'd be interested to hear the perspectives from all of you is that there is, you know, from our analysis, there is a de facto, Russia has essentially, essentially embargoed itself, right? So any, so if you have shipping companies pulling out, insurance providers pulling out, um, you know, there, there is, um, of course, most of the financial linkage is gone. What, you know, how do, how do things actually move physically out of Russia, right? And that's, you know, that the idea that oil goes on tankers. So if, if you can't move it out, what is an additional, you know, what is the additional added value of of, of, a, of an oil embargo besides that political messaging? Um, so that was part of the calculus. Of course, the Biden administration did it, and then a day later, Congress had to do it too. So you know, that's sort of that, like, no, you beat us to that big strong fist that really doesn't pound that hard. But you know, I think that 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 um, when I talk, when I go back to that sort of doggedness here, is that you know, even even when we see Russia default, which is likely, right? Russia, you can't go double bankrupt. We're still gonna continue to put pressure um, because of that political will. Um, you know, may, not meant to make, you know, sort of rational economic sense in a way, but it does, uh, certainly does in, in foreign policy. Thank you so much. Um, so um, our German government so far said that an oil embargo or a gas embargo is not on the table because our dependence um, on energy from uh, energy sources, gas and oil and coal from Russia is certainly a lot higher than it is from the United States. Um, Michael, tell us a little bit about the vulnerability of, um, the, of the German economy and German business and what is currently discussed among your members. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, before answering that question, uh, let me give maybe one remark concerning the comparison of the sanctions, the last uh, sanctions in 2014, I, after Crimea annexation um, and the today's sanctions, and also concerning the mood and uh, yeah, uh, the, the mood and the, the um, position of German business and business leaders. And this is completely different. I quite well remember the discussion back in 2014. You mentioned this uh, famous primat der Politik, uh, primacy of, of politics, that was more an excuse because uh, at that time, I would say the majority of German business and of German business leader were against sanctions. They 
unwillingly followed. Yeah, they accepted it, but uh, the majority was very skeptical about uh, sanctions as a political instrument. And a lot of German business leaders had mm, a certain understanding for Vladimir Putin's um, position. So it was completely different now. And we had the meeting of our board last week. There was no one, really no one who showed any understanding or some excuse or uh, for the Russian position. And I would say the, the most Putin oriented CEOs, they were disappointed uh, much uh, yeah, the most because it is something like, uh, yeah, they were very much disappointed but for, for this position. Now we have even German business leaders who argue for more sanctions, for stricter sanctions. And, they made it also publicly in the press. So it was completely, completely different. And nevertheless, I, I said that uh, by the sanctions which we have now, uh, I think we can handle them. Uh, we are not uh, only in the energy sphere, we are critically dependent on Russia. We have a certain dependency concerning non-ferrous metals, for example, like nickel or palladium or, or titanium but uh, that we can handle. We import a lot of steel, for example, from Russia. There is this question of, uh, of uh, wheat, um, but this is not uh, for Europe, but it is important for the, for the world market. The most crucial thing, the most important thing is gas. Yeah? Even oil, I mean, an oil embargo would be a very strong instrument because Russia is gaining more from oil export worldwide from the world market than from gas export. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, the, the oil market is uh, yeah, to a certain majority or to, to big, bigger majority a spot market. So here we can, uh, Russia can substitute, can give uh, export less oil to Europe, but then more maybe to China or, or to other countries. But uh, gas is for us because the pipeline system, we cannot substitute gas. And uh, all our calculations show that the, uh, the calculations of the economists, for example, uh, Leopoldina, which is uh, quite often quoted in the German press, that this is, for example, only under the condition if we uh, would have a mild winter next week. And we cannot base our decisions on, on the weather. Yeah. This is very dangerous, and uh, if it comes to uh, yeah a serious, um, much more serious development in the in the military conflict, so I would more argue for an uh, oil embargo. It will hit Russia a lot, but it's easier for us to substitute. Gas is really a big problem for uh, for Germany, but also for whole Europe. Michael, tell, tell us a little bit about those companies which have been producing um, in Russia. Are they pulling out their investment? Um, are they closing down their production sites? Um, what are they doing with their workers on the ground? Yeah, the general line it is uh, keeping uh, the, uh, the current business, but no new business, no new orders, no new projects, and just... Uh, running existing projects. This is the general line, I would say. Um, we have the difficulty in production sites with this new law. It hasn't been adopted, but we have now the, uh, the first steps towards this law, kind of nationalization. The, the Russians call it, I would say, rapid bankruptcy, though they can establish an, um, um, I don't know how the, the English expression is for concourseverwalter, I'm sorry, but, uh, um, okay. but maybe majority understands what, what I mean. Uh, so this is dangerous. Therefore, Russian, uh, the German companies uh, try to, to run further the production. And if they lay off uh, people to pay them uh, uh, money for, for the next months, so to keep it in, uh, for, the, for the time being or for the next months in a situation where they're not uh, under the threat of being nationalized. So this is the situation of the day, but it's uh, uh, very fast uh, developing. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you so much for the explanation. Now let's turn to the financial markets um, and Jana and let's hear um, what we are seeing with regard to commodity asset prices and so on. Yeah, and uh, we've been alluding to, obviously this is an economic discussion, sanctions are an economic measure. So the, in, in, in a way this also takes us away from the humanitarian dimension of the conversation and I think fair enough. So I'm going to focus on so the, the second order effects on, on civil societies in the West, on our own, uh, in the EU and in the US. And maybe in, in the first response to Julia's statement about the, the embargo on oil and gas the president has issued. In a way, you could also argue this is just to dial up the European pressure on the Europeans to respond, to do something um, and to kind of cut their ties with Russia. And in a way, it's almost like a bigger question, how much is the US prepared to you know, push Europe, you know, throw it under the bus to an extent um, on, on the way to isolate Russia in this particular endeavor. That's one thing that I really, I'm really worried about sitting in the US. And as it's been mentioned before, I've, when I arrived in New York on Monday morning, or late, late, late Sunday night, the first question that the cab driver asked me, and you know, the cab drivers in New York are like, oh, they, the bellwether for <laughs> what is on people's minds is like, so what's, what's, what's the oil price? What's gas? What's gasoline costing in London these days? I didn't have an answer to that one, but clearly, I mean, the US, um, is pulling that and, and the, the inflationary pressure that is going to ripple from you know the increase not just in gas but obviously even even more so in sorry in oil but also even more so in gas in Europe and, and ultimately electricity prices will impact all of us and so it's been in a way I think a very positive um, signal that came from the EU um, two days ago the um, repower EU um, um, discussion that's been kicked off where you know the European leaders are really aware are meeting to come up with um, a range of measures um, short term and mid term to ultimately gain independence from Russian fuel, um, um, fossil um, um, energy resources, which I think personally is it's, it's just aligned with the general you know, climate conversation we're having, which is good news, but it's gonna take time, it's gonna be painful. And the question is who's gonna bear the pain and who's gonna pay for it ultimately. So the jury's out on that one. And that's also in a way a power discussion. And um, going back to sort of the more granular conversations around what's the impact and on, on the particular um, sort of, you know, um, commodities and oil and gas. I, I mean, I'm sure most people on, on the phone are aware of, of the various conduits, but there's a few dimensions that when I looked into this, that, that I found intriguing and worthwhile to think is obviously as you push up energy prices, as you push up oil and gas prices through this um, particular con conflict, um, it does impact also not just how we ourselves will position in the future on, on, on energy consumption moving away from obviously fossil into alternatives, but it's also going to impact the third, like emerging markets, how they, how much they consume and they get crowded out by prices and how they will have to ultimately import inflation into those um, econo economies as well. So that there's a lot of other dimensions that we should be considering as well, not just so much thinking about the power play between us and, you know, with America and, and our NATO allies vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But I think it's important to keep a big picture here because you know, and we haven't even talked about China at this stage, which is probably another interesting dimension. I don't know if anyone feels wanting to comment on that one, but um, yeah, so, to, sorry for taking it out of the humanitarian discussion, but I think fundamentally this is a power play that's, you know, that's uh, based on, you know, economic uh, levers and, and um, pressure points we have. Mm. Now, thank you so much. And the discussion which we are having is certainly not meant for us to forget the humanitarian dimension. I mean, the sanctions are applied because of the humanitarian dimension. Um, but um, Jana, certainly very, very helpful to dig a little deeper, to dive a little deeper into what is happening with regard to the economic um, implications. Um, I would, if I may, um, I'm seeing um, that Volkmar Klein has also joined us um, today. And um, I'm springing this on you without having asked you beforehand if you could also give us a view from the um, Deutsche Bundestag. Well, of course, it's very difficult to give a view uh, from the, the Bundestag as a, as a whole, but um, <clears throat> I'm really happy that uh, German politics seems to be quite united quite united behind the Ukraine, but of course, at the same time, um, <clears throat> it is very, very difficult to take the right decisions, uh, definitely for <clears throat> uh, our issue today. It's quite easy because it's backed uh, by politics and by business life, but of course, the decisive questions in the Ukraine uh, is the issue of uh, delivering uh, weapons and 
uh, of course, we want to support um, <clears throat> this, this country, but um, the difficult decision is what would be an issue for NATO and what uh, weapons would be, would be too much. So um, <clears throat> I'm actually here, uh, Stormy Annika, to learn a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, maybe much more than uh, what I just said, I cannot really contribute. But thank you so much uh, for coming in. Um, and I would like to hand over to Alexander again. Um, are there any red lines with regard to the sanctions, how far we can go and should go? Well, I think from experience um, in the past, it's um, always good when you talk about sanction regimes uh, that you leave the one who is targeted uh, a little bit in the open of, of what's going to happen. Um, I think um, there are many things that we can think about uh, right now, and we do. Mm -hmm. But I think at the moment, it's also important to uh, really analyze uh, what's going on in Russia and to, to really analyze the impact of what's happening. Um, because there are uh, intended sanctions, there are unintended consequences. Um, and we have to analyze what the Russians are doing. I, I understand that today there is a list of uh, countermeasures coming out or has already come out and uh, we're going to have a look at those. Um, and it also, of course, depends very much of what's going on, on in, in Ukraine, what, what we will see there. And um, uh, I think sanctions are always uh, a part of a political function that we deal with. Uh, and I think uh, looking at uh, the, the, the events on the ground, looking at uh, the impact that um, existing sanctions have, uh, looking at what partners are doing, looking at markets, uh, looking at market reactions, looking at um, uh, individual companies. Uh, we have had a lot of uh, individual talks with companies on what's happening. And also, of course, deliberating in the G7, deliberating in, in other fora where uh, there are companies, uh, sorry, uh, countries which are uh, dear and close to us. Mm -hmm. And also deliberating in the United Nations. I mean, 140 uh, countries have condemned what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and all this, of course, goes into an equation that um, may lead to, to further sanctions. I think uh, we have uh, definitely left this open deliberately left it open and, and we will see what's going to happen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm seeing Fran who raised her electronic hand and I would like to ask everybody to follow her example if you want to come into the discussion. Um, so Fran, over to you. So thanks very much. Thanks for putting this together. And uh, a couple of questions for the group. First off, it's always been my understanding that the Mittelstand in Germany has been quite, um, has had quite a big market in Russia. And that's very different from the United States where we have a few major companies who are involved in Russia who, who can afford you know, to get caught out in this way. Um, but we don't have a lot of the medium sized family owned enterprises that are involved. So I wondered if someone could say something about the impact on that group and what that means for the politics of this in Germany perhaps. And then my question, other question is about energy and particularly whether the Russians might be able to um, substitute markets in the energy field. It's my understanding, which might not be right, that the gas pipeline to China, power of Siberia is not operational yet. Um, and so I'm wondering what other options Putin would have, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China um, should we impose more restrictions? And ov obviously there are the financial restrictions which make any energy related transactions very difficult, but those would not be applied by China and some other countries, I would imagine. So if, if you could speak to that, thanks very much. Thank you so much. This is definitely a question um, to Michael, um, but also to Gabriel. 
And um, after I hand over to, to the two of you, um, I would love to bring in Britta Weber also into the discussion. I'm not sure if she heard me um, because she uh, is responsible for value chains, but also uh, personal matters at UPS. Um, and I think it would be interesting to hear um, a company position as well. But first over to Michael and then to Gabriel. Yeah, that's true that the German Mittelstand is very much engaged in Russia, but the German business uh, as a whole is very much engaged. So we are the, by far the biggest trading partner of Russia in the European Union. We are by far the biggest investor in Russia. So the German business uh, has created almost 300,000 working places in Russia, investing over the years um, around 25 billion euros. So and also the bigger Mittelstand, but uh, uh, having that in mind, I personally do not know any company which is so critically dependent on Russia that this is the stop of Russian business would be an existential threat to them. Maybe there are some specialized uh, um, uh, Mittelstands or um, uh, small and medium sized companies, but I personally do not know them. It would be very painful for a lot of them, very critical, but it's not uh, existential threat for them. And maybe just one remark to the uh, statement of Alexander Schoenfelder. So I fully agree that we maybe should stop now for a while and analyzing the effects of the sanctions which we have already adopted, because we should remind ourselves that sanctions are not an end in, the, in itself. Sanctions are an instrument to change behavior. And maybe now we adopted really hard sanctions and maybe it's time for some days to inhale and then <laughs> exhale with, but to wait a little bit. Yeah? This is just, just a remark. Thank you. Um, over to Gafel. Uh, thank you for the question. No, maybe let me, let me let me second uh, Michael on his last point. I think it's it's important that we see that that we, the sanctions per se are a sign of failure. What what we need is to keep a threat alive, and that's where we need to be very careful in, in imposing those those sanctions that we could still impose because once they are imposed, they are gone. No, and uh, and, and uh, use them wisely or use the threat wisely and incredibly. I think that's that's that must be the motto of the day. Now, uh, it's, it's I think it's it's. It's important to notice that uh, the Mittelstand has reacted to the 2014 shock already, uh, because we see this in the data. So they have they have um, pulled out of, of Russia. They have uh, they have diversified their portfolio, uh, and and so I think they are much more resilient today than they were eight years ago. Um, and if you look at the aggregate numbers. It, it doesn't seem to be to be a big a big problem on the export side. And then the, the question was about China. So there's an interesting map that has gone around. I think the Financial Times had it you know, on the on the forecast gas pipeline network of Russia in 2025. And what you see there is that even if that China pipeline uh, becomes operational, it only uh, goes from, from central eastern Siberian gas fields to China. The entire big network of you know, connecting the western si Siberian fields to world markets runs through uh, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine. And, so, um, and that's true for, for oil pipelines as well. So it's not easy for Russia uh, to, to pipe their stuff elsewhere. Not to China, and, and, you know, even the tankers are hard to, to operate. The, the, the gas is in, in northern Siberia, uh, the, the Arctic Sea is, is, is not an easy place to, to ship around huge quantities of, uh, of stuff. Uh, it would be very expensive. So someone has said in our panel that oil embargo would be, would be the next logical step, and I agree. And, and the point is that it would be much uh, it, it would much less expensive for us in, uh, in in Germany, in Europe in general, and it would not not uh, create such uh, heterogeneity of costs. You know, we have tried to simulate what the gas embargo does, and it creates huge pain in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Austria, in uh, uh, in Germany. It actually creates gains in Norway and in other countries. An oil embargo is is much more even across uh, the effects are much more even across the 
the, the transatlantic alliance. And that may, that's good for the coalition. So gas is toxic for many reasons, also for the internal cohesion of the, of the coalition. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, over to Jana. Yeah, this is very helpful for me as well to understand positions and thinking. And um, the more I listen, the more I, I feel quite strong about um, what Alex just said to, to really reinforce. I mean, sanctions are a threat and it put it, you know, actually putting them in place doesn't necessarily help. And I think the more we go down that, that avenue of putting restrictions in place around the energy supply and demand, you know, it's, it's obviously happening on both sides, the more we, we heard not just ourselves, but we heard the global economy and that's just, everybody's gonna pay a price for that one. And so in a way, going back to what Volkmar's been saying earlier, we should like, you know, we, yes, for, sanctions are an important tool here, but we should, we must focus on getting back on the table, understanding, you know, the negotiation. That's really the question I want to, you know, push back to, to the panel as well, to my colleagues on the panel is, what are the, you know, what are we doing? Like, where are we heading there? It's, what are we negotiating? What's the ask? What's, what can we offer? Where's the, you know, what's the, the buff there? Sort of, we need to define that one. And sanctions is just, ultimately, it's going to get worse for everyone here. And it's going to create instability in the Western world as well, eventually. Even so, I think the EU measures that are being put in motion, you know, are just accelerating, you know, developments in the right direction, check, but it's going to take time, as we we're just discussing. So, again, we have to get back to the table with Putin. You know, again, going to my, to my very first comment, I personally don't see the sanctions going to kick Putin out of the office and stop the war any near term. I just can't see it. I, don't, I haven't seen it with Iran. We haven't seen it with Korea or North Korea. I'm open to listen to <laughs> examples, but I, I don't believe it. So we need to find other ways of resolving the issue and also ultimately really finally to stop that humanitarian disaster to further you know, escalate. Mm. Um, Alexander, can I hand over that difficult question to you? Well, we tried. Uh, we definitely tried uh, for many months, actually, to, to talk to the Russian government. Um, we um, still continue to offer um, avenues which are different from sanctions. Um, there are ongoing, um, I think, talks um, which are happening. Um, but uh, it seems to us that at the moment uh, there is a little willingness on the Russian side to actually really constructively talk about ending the Ukrainian crisis. Um, and uh, since we, I think, wisely decided not to act militarily in the conflict, there is not much left than talking about sanctions and uh, to, to further that, that instrument. I think at the moment we have um, many more options in the sanctions field, which are openly discussed. Um, and we continue to offer to uh, the Russian government um, opportunities to talk about it. Um, but it seems to us again, that if, you know, talks are always uh, uh, something that needs two to tango and if only one shows up, it's difficult. Thank you. Julia, uh, thank you so much. Um, Julia, are there any further options on the table? Yes, I mean, besides, besides gas, obviously in the US, you have the, it's the secondary sanction measure. It's always in the back pocket of, every, um, of, of everyone, which then applies to, you know, would implicate um, third countries, right? Um, and you could do full blocking on a whole range of Russian industry that hasn't been touched yet, um, full blocking on all the banks. I mean, the, I think that there are, you know, some people are saying you could even do sort of a, from the U.S. legal perspective, a jurisdictional blocking on the Russian state. I don't, but again, I don't, I mean, I just, I just share the, the perspective of some of my colleagues here. What do, what do you actually what is the actual goal of that, of those, of ramping that up right now, right? Besides frustration, anger, fear, um, you know, I think we haven't quite fully digested the impact of what we did with the reserves, right? And again, that is, you know, you know, in terms of global imbalances, in terms of what you do to Russia uh, over the longer term. I mean, again, that is something unprecedented. I mean, it's just, I keep saying the word unprecedented, but I look at this and I compare this to US sanctions programs, again, on, on Iran and Venezuela, we've mentioned that before. You do that, we, you know, cutting Russia off from the economy happened over days to the 11th largest country, economy in the world um, with a traded currency, right? 
Iran was over years. Venezuela was over, was over months, and it was also. And again, these were these were unilateral efforts, largely on the in the U.S., especially the unilateral um, Iran stuff under the Trump administration, right? As you know, I mentioned, the political goal failed, but you know, from a from a perspective of of economic and financial pressure, they succeeded. Um, so if you then apply that to Russia, right? You know, we don't really know what the consequences of that are going to be in, you know, in um, in global markets, in sovereign debt markets, um, in you know, commodities. And so, you know, for me, I say, uh, you know, right right now at this very moment, I would say just continue to arm the Ukrainians to the teeth and wait to see to pull to pull the trigger. I think that if you um, pulling you know, that, that I, you know, I would not say, you know, personally say Germany, you know, stab yourself over gas right now, because I don't know whether that changes what the Russians do when their economy falls out from underneath them. That I, I'm repeating myself from before, but again, there are options that we could, that we could use. Um, but I think that, you know, the, this sort of added value on that sort of utility curve, um, shifts. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so very much. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time than 60 minutes. Um, unfortunately, the time is running um, out. Um, but I want to do one last round um, and ask you again um, a, a, the same question to all of you. And that is about alliances, um, about the Western alliance, but also um, alliances with countries like China and um, India. Um, what is your um, expectations? Are alliances going to hold? Um, can new alliances be found with, for example, China to contain Russia? Um, or will it be tough enough to keep those alliances going, which we currently have? And I start with you, Alexander. Well, I think what we can observe is that the world is more and more divided between countries that are more or less democratic and those who are more or less autocratic. And I think this, this divide will deepen uh, in, in the next years or even decades. Uh, and I think this is something that we have to deal with. And in a certain way, um, this crisis uh, woke us up, uh, not only in Europe, but maybe also in the Western world as such. And I hope that this uh, ties that those ties will continue uh, to, to be relevant in the future. When it comes to China, I think it's very important that we continue to talk to them and, and, and to, to tell them that we feel that they are absolutely isolated when sticking with Russia. But it, it uh, also, uh, I think, is very difficult because they are autocratic too. So it's, it's a really, uh, in the end, for them, a, a question what is more important to them economy or, or the, the, the structure of the state. And I think this is a question that, um, I mean, um, that you have to specifically talk about to our American friends, because I think um, they, they have to deal with China much more than we have. Um, but, but I think it's, it's a Western question. It's a Western question, how, how to deal with auto, autocratic regimes in the future. I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, and over to Julia. Sure. I mean, I think when it comes to, um, well, obviously, when it comes to, um, to alliances, this one has shown that the transatlantic one, at least on Russia, could not be better. I'm a little bit scared once this, you know, as it died in the world transatlanticist, that once this subsides, we're going to have this sort of, dis sort of resurgent resur disappointment that, ah, we actually have disagreements on many other things. Um, you know, when it comes to China, I think that they, you know, political calculus and economic calculus, they're, you know, careful at juggling both. And if you're worth, you're extending Russia a line of credit, you probably at this time are saying, I'm never going to see that again. And so, you know, I think that that is sort of the tightrope that the Chinese will walk. I also think that maybe the U.S. should not pressure China right now because the, the visibility of US pressuring China will force them to show to to turn back to Russia at least in some symbolic way. You know, I think like let your banks make a rational cold decision. We prefer the dollar to credit that we'll never see a return on. Um, 
you know, um, but, you know, I'm probably very much in the minority on that view. Um, you know, I think that what we'll see is different constellations of global agreement on different issues. Um, and that we'll have to be much more agile in the formats that we use. What does the G20 look like now? We're gonna, you know, right? Maybe we need, you know, maybe the G20 is, you know, it was the financial crisis mechanism that saved us, but maybe now there's a different constellation of countries that need to be gathered together. Um, uh, what, I, you know, what I think that the US itself has lost a lot of moral suasion um, and leverage if you see, you know, uh, you know, US diplomacy now going around the world trying to beg for oil. Um, you know, every countries aren't just, you know, responding to US pressure or US requests just 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 because, you know, we're the US, right? And I think that that what that means, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with that because I think that this is an incredible moment for Europe. And that the impact of 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 European cohesion and the impact of what the euro can do as a currency, right? is changing and that is going to be for me less of a less of a determinant of where the US economy goes or even if we get some trump acolyte in the office two and a half years from now it'll scare the shit out of me but i'm more concerned about and 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 interested in how europeans leverage themselves right in 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 the next 5 years i think that that's that that's the critical factor thank you so much um, gabriel what's your take On alliances, uh, I think what we can say uh, is that autocratic regimes don't build stable alliances. Very hard for them. They are intrinsically opportunistic. So I, th I think, I think uh, even if it might make sense at some point in time, in, in a certain configuration of things for Russia and China to team up, that will never be a stable coalition. Uh, and for other non-democratic countries, is is similar. So. Um, I think I agree with what Julia said. This is the moment for, for Europe. If we get things done right, you know, there is an incredible chance to push for, for uh, more cooperation in security, uh, in common defense, in armament, uh, in, you know, to really create an energy union. I think these are real, I think we need to seize the moment. Um, and uh, that could also then help us stabilize the transatlantic uh, coalition. A more united Europe would make it easier uh, to balance that transatlantic relationship. So there's that, that's my my five cents on on. Uh, and but if you see, and if you look at the um, the former Soviet uh, republics, you know, they are not very uh, eager to join the the Russian uh, uh, you know empire. No, so, so, so to rebuild, to go back to history, to what, what, it was, what it was before. Even in Belarus, there's a lot of opposition. In Kazakhstan, you no, know, in Georgia. So it's not, you know, teaming up with autocratic countries. I think is is, is not not something very attractive, even for other autocratic countries. Thank you very much, um, Michael. Yeah, I think the, the current conflict has the tendency to, to deepen the, yeah, the tendency for decoupling for a political, technological and, uh, um, and economic decoupling. This is, I think, uh, from uh, the point of view of German business, a very dangerous development because we would be the, the main losers in such a decoupling. And uh, my second point is if we look at this a new partnership of Russia and China. Uh, I fully agree with, with Gabriel. This is not a stable uh, partnership, uh, especially from the point of view of, of the Russians, because they will be in such a coalition with China, the junior, junior partner. They will be totally dependent uh, on China. China will dominate everything. And the Russian understands that uh, quite well. So I have had the chance to discuss that with many Russian uh, political leaders in the in the last years, and they see it quite clearly. So they are this dependency and the threat for Russia. So I fully agree that that will not be a stable coalition. And last but not least, Jana. Yeah, I can echo what mostly has been said. I agree. I, I personally think in China, hopefully the outcome will be that China remains, you know, positive, sorry, so it remains neutral and doesn't sway towards Russia for the reasons mentioned, not last, last but not least, 
because of the threat of secondary sanctions and, and their own you know, connectivity with the global financial and, and economic system by now. Um, on, on the US, clearly, I mean, this is a European conflict. So the, you're seeing the US aligned on Europe aligned, that you, it goes both ways, obviously. Seeing the two aligned more strongly on this particular case and therefore interacting more strongly on foreign policy is, is a good news. It's, it's a good event after obviously some, some uh, it's like let's have cold war times <laughs> or some Trump years. Um, and yeah, I, the, the thing that I think in a way every every event has a positive. And in my mind, I agree with my my, my colleagues in the panel. The, uh, the coherence we'll see in, in in the reaction by the European Union is a very good one. And that's not just in, in terms of um, foreign policy and and uh, but also you know the, the discussion we've had before on, on energy policy and um, you know climate change and just the, the, seeing Hungary you know. Come along. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's good news. Could somebody mute uh, Hubertus, please? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so as I'm saying, good news for us in the EU, hopefully. So over back to you, Stromy. Thank you so very, very much. Um, we've gone a little bit over time. Thank you so much for sticking uh, with us. Um, this has been an incredible rich discussion and I hope that we can continue it. And next time we take a little bit more time because there's so many ex experts in this round we haven't heard from, from Britta Weber from UPS, Catherine Dusman from your point, um, business point of view, but also Helge Tolksdorf. There are so many who would have something to say who we couldn't bring into the uh, discussion, but we will continue to do so. I do agree. This is an incredible moment for Europe. And I very much hope um, that we take the chance uh, to stay united um, as we currently are um, and to draw our lessons. Thank you so very much. Next week, we are going to discuss the Western Balkans in a public event, looking very much, I mean, we are going to focus on Serbia um, and the elections. And um, the person responsible um, for this event, Tina, maybe you're going to, can you wave? Very good. Thank you. If you're interested in participating, please uh, let Tina know. We would love to see you. Um, certainly, we will look at the elections, but I'm also very, very certain that we are looking at how the region and how Serbia is positioning itself in the conflict. Um, and if the alliances, which we just talked about, are going to hold. I also hope that we eventually can put together an event um, with our Indian partners um, to also take a look at how India is positioning itself. We talked a lot about um, China. Um, we talked um, a little bit about other regions, um, but not so much about um, India yet, if that could be a partner or not. So come back. <laughs> There's lots more to talk about. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, this has been a very enriching discussion. Thank you so much. And I wish you a good remaining um, evening. Thank you.